All right, so we're talking about identity crisis, and Dave tied in perfectly to that because he's talking about who he is. He's a man who builds race cars for the Lord. Uh, that's not me, but that's Dave, and I love that God is using him in that way. Uh, during this series, we've been talking about the idea that we need to lay down our self-constructed identities. Um, we have, all of us, decided at one point or another, and maybe it's changed over the years, this is who I am, right? If I look back on my life, uh, there was a time where I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist. I decided that's who I am. It's funny because I was terrible in science class. But anyway, I decided I wanted to be a scientist. I went into my mom's uh, cleaning supplies. I mixed them all together and made a uh, weed killer, right? I went outside and I sprayed them on stuff and it, they all died. And I was super happy with myself until my mom noticed that I killed her roses. Uh, so, and I didn't even keep track of what I mixed together. I couldn't recreate it if I wanted to. Uh, later in life, when I was about in eighth grade, I decided about, I wanted to be a grunge rocker. Uh, that was during the Nirvana uh, Pearl Jam era. Everybody in Seattle was wearing flannel and, and had long hair, and so that's how I dressed, and I was going to be a grunge rocker. Uh, later, luckily, I, I, I met the Lord and decided I wanted to be a minister, right? But we, we decide at certain points in our lives, this is who I am, this is who I'm going to be. Um, but those are self-constructed, and they change easily. They're almost like the tides. They come and they go. One day we're this, the next day we're that. And, and, and we decide, this is who I am. But the question we've been asking is, who are we really, right? Who are we really? One of my favorite authors, Henry Nowen, says there are five lies that we tell ourselves about our identity. The first is, I am what I have. Andrew talked about this last week, right? I am what I have. My, my possessions define me. I own a classic car. That's who I am. I'm a classic car enthusiast. I own a big house. Now I got to fill it with stuff. I go deeper and deeper into debt to try to live into this image of who I am. I dress a certain way. That's who I am. My possessions define me. I am what I have. The second lie, he says, is I am what I do, right? So our occupation defines us. I am a construction worker. I'm good with my hands. That's who I am. I am a farmer. I work hard in the fields. That's who I am. And we let these things that we do define us. I remember having a deep conversation with a kid. He was the star quarterback on a state championship football team. But then he graduated and he didn't get recruited by colleges to play football anymore. And his question was, who am I? Right? For, for so many years, I built my entire identity based on the fact that I was the quarterback. That's who I was. Well, what, what about when I'm not that anymore? What about when I can't play football anymore? Who am I? And he went through a period of self-crisis because what he did defined who he was, and now he needed to figure out who he was again. The third lie that now one identifies is, I am what other people say or think of me. We let other people define our identity. So someone tells a, a little girl that she's pretty, and, and she spends the rest of her life trying to put on makeup and wear fancy clothes and impress people with her physical appearance. But unfortunately, we know that 90-year-olds don't win beauty pageants. So when your physical appearance changes, who are you now, right? Or if someone tells you you're smart, and you spend the rest of your life trying to get that scholarship and trying to get straight A's. What about when you get a A minus? Does that shatter your self-identity? Right? If we let other people define who we are, then we're giving them way too much power in our lives. The fourth one is that I'm nothing more than my worst moment. Guys, this one kills me. When you make a mistake, when you blow it big time, when you look back on your life and you have regret, deep regret over the, the worst moment in your life, or maybe it's not something you did. Maybe it's something that someone did to you. Maybe you were abused or neglected, and you've allowed that worst moment in your life to define you. You allow yourself to start thinking, I am a failure. I am messed up. There's something wrong with me because of this thing that I did or that happened to me. You allow the worst moment of your life to define who you are. Or, the fifth one, he says that I'm nothing better than my best moment. Right? So maybe you made the winning shot in a basketball game, and you live your whole life telling people that story in that moment when you were 18, and that's who you are for the rest of your life. 
you're a success because of one thing that you did. We give too much power to too many false identities. So what we've been asking through this whole series is, who am I really? What is the identity that will last? Not it's going to come and go because of whatever fad is happening in the world today. Not that's going to come and go because of what someone might say or think about me. But who am I really? Who am I in God's eyes? So we've been talking about laying down these false identities. I want to review really quickly what we've discussed. We talked about laying down our feelings of inadequacy. That I'm not good enough. Right? We're going to, we're going to end that lie because you are a child of God. And, and no matter what failures or faults or weaknesses you might have, when you give them to the Lord, he says he uses our weaknesses for his strength, right? So we're going to lay down our feeling of inadequacy. Second week, we talked about we're going to lay down our need for control. You don't have to control everything because God is in control. And, and ultimately, what it means to be a child of God is giving your life to God and letting him be in charge instead of you. Last week, Pastor Andrew talked about laying down the American dream, right? That we're going to be happy and, and, and successful if we have enough or if we earn enough. And that's just not true, right? Uh, the Bible tells us that we can't serve God and money. We have to choose. Who are we going to serve? And then today we're talking about laying down our longing for approval. So give me, just a show of hands, if you are a people pleaser. Anybody in this room a people pleaser? You love to make people happy. You hate to let people down. Yeah, I am also a people pleaser. Uh, so I understand what you're talking about. And I just want to give you a couple signs. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, um, but I'm going to say a couple things, and then maybe in a few minutes you'll be like, you know what? I am a people pleaser. So a couple signs that you are longing for approval of others. First, you worry a lot about what people think of you. You worry a lot about what people think of you. So social media is this new thing over the last you know, 10 years or so where we are able to put ourselves out there on the internet for the world to see, and then people give us feedback in the form of likes or little hearts or smiley face emojis, right? And it doesn't matter if it's Twitter or social media or Instagram or whatever the cool new thing is that kids are doing these days, TikTok or whatever. Okay, it doesn't matter. All social media, it feeds this desire for people to give us approval. So we take a picture, right? Uh, we, we put on eight different filters and we add cat ears or whatever the kids are doing these days. We put a picture on the internet and then we just, we wait for the likes to pour in, right? For people to tell us, oh, that's such a great picture. You look so happy. Everything's wonderful. Wow, you look great, right? We want that positive feedback. And I've talked to teenagers who they say, if I don't get 100 likes on a picture that I post, I take it down. Because clearly it wasn't good enough. Clearly, I didn't look good enough, right? They demand positive feedback on everything they do in their lives. And if they don't get enough, then they are a failure, right? Or if you don't get enough followers, if you don't get enough friends, if you don't get enough likes, we're, we're depending on others to give us this positive feedback because that's who we are and that's what we need. Or you walk into a, your closet, right? You walk into your closet, you look at all your clothes, and a lot of you have a lot of clothes. And you think to yourself, I have nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear, right? Even though I'm looking at a closet full of clothes, oh, that's old, that's outdated, oh, that's so 2007, right? Like we're looking at all these clothes and we're thinking, I can't wear capris to this. I don't wear capris, but I'm reenacting a situation that my wife goes through every day, right? <laughs> like we look at our closet, we say we have nothing to wear. Why? Because we're trying to impress others. Because we want someone to tell us that they like our outfit, that we look Nice. We are trying to impress others. We worry about what they think of us. Or, this one gets me. You are overly sensitive. Overly sensitive. Let me tell you what I mean by that. People's words have so much power over you. Right? And we're weird. People are weird. Because one negative comment, in my mind, equals 100 positive. So uh, I might be in the lobby after church and a hundred of you could come up and tell me that you liked my sermon. But if one person sends me one email telling me something that I said or did wrong, that's all I remember. I promise you, that's all I remember. I don't remember any of the compliments. All I remember is that one thing. 
and I say, I failed. I failed, right? I worked all week on a sermon. I tried my best, but I failed. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't theologically correct enough. I failed because of one negative comment. My uh, senior pastor that I worked for used to say, we give too much power to the no vote. Too much power to the no vote, right? We ignore all the positive feedback. Or someone walks up to us, randomly in the street, whatever, and they ask a very simple question. They say, are you okay? Right, which maybe they're being very nice. Maybe they're being courteous. But we immediately think to ourselves, uh-oh, like what's wrong? What's wrong? Is something wrong? Do I have something in my teeth? Do I have bags under my eyes? Is my hair out of shape? Like, do I look tired? Why are you asking me, am I okay? When in reality, they're probably just being nice and asking if we're okay. But we start to panic because we worry too much. We're too sensitive about what other people think, okay? A couple more, and I'll roll through these, these ones more quickly. We compromise our values. We compromise our values because of what other people think of us. You know, we used to talk when we were teenagers a lot about peer pressure. Adults still feel peer pressure. We don't talk about it as much as we did when we were teenagers, but we still feel peer pressure. There is peer pressure to fit in, to act a certain way, to make people like us, right? Maybe it's a young lady who starts dating a boy, and he wants to go farther physically than she is comfortable with, and he's telling her all the right stuff, that he loves her, blah, 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 and eventually she gives into that peer pressure to do things that she knows she shouldn't do before marriage. Maybe it's jokes. Maybe you're in the office at the water cooler and somebody tells an inappropriate joke and everybody's laughing. And you know that it's inappropriate, but you laugh too. Maybe you even chime in with one of your own, right? We know we shouldn't. We know it's not right, but we do it anyway. Maybe it's language. Maybe everybody else is saying words that you know are not good. And the Bible tells us that we should be careful about the words that we speak, that they should be uh, glorifying to God and that we should speak encouragement. But instead, we fall into even, even Christian bad words. You know what I'm talking about? Like, sometimes we won't say the S word. We'll say another word that's similar in length and size to that word, right? Is that really how God wants us to speak, to use our mouths? Or maybe it's the pressure to keep up with the Joneses. You know that the Bible talks a lot about money that we should live within our means, that we shouldn't go into debt, that the, the, the borrower is a slave to the lender. We know that that's true scripturally, but man, everybody else seems to be driving a nice car. And isn't it tempting to want one of your own? Right? So we, we decide to give in to debt, which we know is not God's plan for our lives, because we want to keep up with everything else. We compromise our values because of what others think. Or we hesitate sharing our faith because we're worried people will laugh at us. We're worried people won't like us. We're worried that we don't even know what we're saying. We don't know all the right words. We don't know all the Bible verses. And so we don't share our faith because we're worried of getting rejected or laughed at or told no. And lastly, you have a hard time saying no. That's classic people pleaser, right? People ask you to do something and you think to yourself, please, Lord, no, don't let them ask me, right? Like, I don't want to do this. But, but all you say is, sure, that sounds great. Where do I sign up, right? You're giving in to pressure. You're giving in to what people think. You're allowing them to have too much control over you. And here's what I'm trying to get at today. That becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. If you want to write something down in your notes today, write that down. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest and easiest way to forget what God thinks about you. And here in a minute, we're going to go over what God thinks about you, right? But I just want to say that don't give people too much power in your life. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe fear of man one of the the main uh themes of the book of proverbs is fear of god right which doesn't mean fear like um you know scary movie fear it's more like respect it's awe right uh, understanding who god is in relation to us and understanding the reverence we should have for him but we're giving that same power to people and when we do it says it's a trap 
It's a snare. It will trap you, right? So instead, we should trust in the Lord, not in what people think. And ultimately, giving too much power to people is a form of idolatry. Idolatry is one of the main sins identified in the Old Testament. And you're thinking, I've never built a gold statue of anyone, right? I don't, I don't bow down and worship it. But giving people too much power in your life takes away from the power that God should have, which is a form of idolatry. We are acting like we worship them rather than we worship God. We're putting people ahead of Christ, and that is a form of idolatry. Ultimately, these two things are true if we give too much power to people. The first is that people are too big in my life and God is too small. People are too big in my life and God is too small. Their voice is too loud in my ear and God's is too quiet. We need to check our motivation. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we living how we're living? Why am I acting the way I'm acting? Why am I dressing the way I'm dressing? Is it because it's who God says I am or is it because of who people say I should be? And then ultimately, we're asking people to meet a need that only God can meet. When we give people too much power, we are putting them up on a pedestal, and, and ultimately they are going to disappoint us. When we start putting people up on pedestals, they are going to disappoint us because they're people, and people are flawed. And if we start treating people like we treat God, then we're in for a rude awakening because they are going to disappoint us. You may have heard the phrase before, don't meet your heroes. Well, why? Because they're going to disappoint you. If we put people up on pedestals, they're going to disappoint us because they're people. They're not meant to be worshipped. They're not meant to be idolized. We can respect people, especially godly people, but we shouldn't put them up on pedestals because they're going to let us down. Instead, we need to keep God on the throne and only God on the throne. There's a song that I used to sing in college. Um, I went to a Christian college, and we had chapel three times a week, and this was a common song uh, led by one of the worship leaders. He was an amazing musician. And I had never heard it before I went uh, to college, but we sang it pretty often. And, and I hear the refrain in my head from time to time. I'm just going to say it to you. I'm not going to sing it to you today. It's called Be Magnified. It's by Don Moen. He says, I have made you too small in my eyes. O oh Lord, forgive me. And I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. But now, O oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my eyes and with my song, O oh Lord, be magnified. O oh Lord, be magnified. Be magnified, O oh Lord. You are highly exalted. And there is nothing you can't do. Oh, Lord, my eyes are on you. Be magnified. That, that first line, I have made you too small in my eyes. Man, that just like hit me in the gut. As a college freshman who, who thought I understood who God was, but frankly, my picture of God was just way too small. Right? These are the things that God does. This is how God acts. I mean, it just got blown out of the water, right? And you start to realize... God is bigger, God is stronger, God is more amazing than you could ever comprehend. And we sometimes put God into a box and we say, stay there because I'm going to do my own thing for a while. Be magnified, O oh Lord, be magnified. Help me understand who you are and what you do. So, I want to, at the end of this series, put to death people-pleasing, okay? Put, we're just going to put it to death. I want you to live the rest of your life not worried about what men think of you, but what God thinks of you. So we're going to try to put this to death. And, and I got a couple of suggestions about how to do that. First, focus on pleasing God instead of pleasing people. Galatians 1.10 says, Obviously, I am not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Right? If you want to make everyone happy in the world... Sell ice cream. Everyone will love you, okay? If you want, though, to please God, then follow his commandments, live out his word, be a faithful follower of Jesus. It's not going to make everybody happy, trust me. There are going to be people who disagree with you. There are going to be people who don't like you. There are going to be people who think you're small-minded. 
But you don't worry about that because you're focused on one thing, which is serving the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, right? You can't please everyone. Don't try. Focus on pleasing God and God alone. That's how you live the Christian life. And you've got to have some thick skin, and you've got to have some, uh, what do I sometimes say? You've got to have, like, optional hearing, right? I'm just going to ignore that. I didn't hear that. Selective hearing. Thank you very much. Yeah, selective hearing. I'm going to focus instead on what God says and who God says I am. The second thing you need to do is live for the approval of God instead of the approval of people. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. We are going to live for him and for him alone. Right? We are going to live for God's approval. And so that means that my worth is not based on what people think, but on what God thinks. You can tell me that I'm not good enough. You can tell me I'm not smart enough. You can tell me about my failures and my flaws, and trust me, I am already aware of them. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't even really matter what I think. What matters is what God thinks. That's what matters. That's, that's who I am. I am a child of God. I am beloved in His eyes. I am weak. I admit openly. But in my weakness, He is strong. And so I, I try to live my life, guys, by a really simple rule. I try to preach by a very simple rule. Um, in truth, and as much as I love all of you, I'm not preaching for you. I'm preaching to you, but I'm not preaching for you. I'm preaching for an audience of one, and that is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? That's why I show up. That's why I preach, because he put a calling on my life. He put a fire in my heart, and that's what I got to do. Okay? And, and if nobody showed up, I, I would still do it. It would be awkward, I admit, but I would still do it, right? Um, and, and we give way, 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 way too much credit um, to pastors who have huge churches, right? We lift them up on pedestals and we say, that guy, that guy's successful. That guy's got it together. He's got thousands of people in his church. And there are some, don't get me wrong, amazing pastors who serve in large churches. But we don't give nearly enough credit to the guy in the tiny country church who shows up each and every week to preach to his flock of 10 people, and he is faithful in loving them. He is faithful in serving them. He is faithful in teaching the word to him. We, we ignore those pastors. We, we in, in fact, sometimes even kind of laugh at them because they're not successful. They're failures in our eyes. But guys, those guys in heaven are going to be wearing robes of white because they have served the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ well. They have been faithful with what they've been given to do. We need to remember who we're preaching for. And it's Jesus and Jesus only. So I preach for an audience of one. I'm glad you're here uh, also. So I want to end today um, by reminding you of who you are. And we, we've used a lot of these verses already through the series. But I want to say them just kind of back to back to back to back to back. I want to remind you of who you are. Not in my eyes, not in your eyes, not in anybody else's eyes, but in God's eyes. Who are you? You are a new creation in Christ. You are forgiven and your sins are washed away. You are more than a conqueror through Christ. You are God's masterpiece. You are the light of the world. You are filled with the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You are a joint heir with Christ. You are Christ's ambassador. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And you are greatly loved by God. That is who you are. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know who you think you are. I don't know what identity you've decided that you are today. I don't know what identity you put on yourself. I don't know what somebody said to you that, that stuck with you and that you can't shake. I don't know what guilt or baggage or shame that you've brought into this place that you think defines you. 
I don't know what weaknesses and flaws you've allowed to tell you who you are. But you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are my brother. You are my sister. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are his beloved child. He died for you. He has forgiven you. He has set you free and he has washed you as white as snow. That's who you are. Don't let anybody else tell you anything different. Don't believe the lie that you are anything other than the beloved child of God. That's who you are. I want to end by reading Colossians chapter 3. Because we've got to remember who we're going to serve. As we leave this place, are you going to allow yourself to slip back into the, the people-pleasing mode? Or are you going to remember your true identity? That everything we do, everything we do, not just the churchy stuff, everything we do is for the Lord. If you work in an office, you work in that office for the Lord. If, if you raise children and you're a, a homemaker, you raise those children for the Lord. Right? Right? If you serve on the, the school board, you're serving not just for those kids, you're serving the Lord. Whatever you do is for the Lord. Everything you do, everything you, every opportunity that comes your way, you can do it for the people that you're serving or you can do it for the Lord. So Colossians 3 says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Would you pray with me, church? <sighs> Father God, I am yours. I am your child. You love me. You made me. You know me. You sent your son Jesus to die for me. I am yours. I can be no other. Let me set aside any false identity that I have claimed. Let me lay it down. Let me smash that idol and instead put you on the throne in my life. Lord, I am yours. I know I'm not good enough. I know the mistakes that I've made. But you have washed me white as snow. Father, help us as a church to live into the identity that you have given us. We are your children. We are your people. And you love us. Lord, help us be that. Help us live that. And help us know it to the depth of our bones. Father, we praise you in this place. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because we are forgiven and free and because we are yours. And all God's people said, Amen.